But talk to me about one, what importance do you assign to IoT in today's what I call the great tech game, where tech is determining your economic mm. prosperity? And second, how can nations cultivate it if it doesn't exist? And it goes back to you know, your point about tech creativity. If certain countries are more tech creative, others are not. The question really, in my mind, is how can those countries become more tech creative? How can they do more R&D? Is it just a matter of money or is there more to it? No. I think it's 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 a matter of, of, of many things. And these, are, these are very hard. These are very hard questions. Um, but to some extent, I think um, the, the the limitations of intellectual property rights and the patent system and you know other forms of protecting your your intellectual property right. I mean, these are essentially temporary things, right? So you know, patents run out after fifteen years, uh, and uh, uh, you know, eventually uh, there is there seems to be few institutional barriers for the flow of technology. I'm not thinking about five years. In the short term, yes. But over long term, you know, you can sort of see <laughs> how the how these Asian tigers, which I talked about, essentially built uh, uh, economic prosperity, basically on knowledge that was by and large generated in the Western world. I mean, for better or for worse, this is true. You look at what China has done and essentially what they've been doing. They've been producing very similar goods that the West has been producing for a much longer time, but they do it better, they do it cheaper, they do it faster, they, you know, whatever. It, it, and it, so, it, but, it, but, but it's not like, it's not like they, they, they develop these goods. So this, this, this knowledge does flow across borders. I mean, look at, at India, if you want, you know, you look at the pharmaceutical in the industry in India, right. a lot of this is essentially, then you're doing, you pre- yeah, making the generic thing is reverse. Yeah. In, in yeah, a way, if you find in a historical context, it's like a reversal. You read about yeah. uh, the China that you were talking about, that yeah. after the Mongols, they stopped innovating. But, right? So That's here, but, sort of takes that yeah. thing and says, I'm going to make it but better. So here, so, so here is my take on this, and you can take it or leave it. Okay? But for me, what makes a society creative and successful is its willingness to uh, engage non-conformism and to be pluralist uh, and to encourage people to think outside the box. And um, not all societies have that. For instance, you know, my sense is that most autocratic totalitarian regimes basically fail to see that. You know, one of the great mysteries of 20th century his- uh, history is the failure of the Soviet Union to take technological leadership over the West. And I still remember, I'm old enough to remember vaguely now, I must say, <laughs> the is launching of the first Sputniks in 1957. And essentially all those experts, including great economists in the United States, basically said, you know, they have a better system than we do. And they will bury us, as Khrushchev said. Right. Uh, and, uh, and because they can, they launched Sputnik and then they launched Yuri Gagarin and, you know, they took the lead in, 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 and we all thought, oh my God, that system is technologically much more successful than the West. And that turned out to be completely false. And the reason it's false is because in unique societies in which, which are tolerant of people who have crazy ideas. and. Out of 100 crazy ideas, 99 of them are going to be completely useless by, you know, crazy ideas thought of by crackpots, which could never work. And the one will change the world, but you don't know which one. So you have to tolerate all, a, all 100. And I think that is what is what did in the Soviet Union technologically. And eventually it will be very difficult for China to maintain the kind of autocratic totalitarian regime that has been uh, re- regrowing, I said, coming back in China under Xi Jinping, and I think eventually it means that they will lose the technological race in the West. Not because there's something inherently about Chinese culture that that's nonsense. What it is is you need people to think freely and speak their mind. And once you allow that, it can't be just people 
speaking freely on you know technical issues in I don't know what material science or or molecular biology. You have to let them speak freely about anything. So I lived, I grew up in Israel, and I I still have very strong connections there. And the saying in Israel always was, it's not that people think outside the box; it's that there's no box. <laughs> and if you've ever you know if you ever spend any time in Israel, you know people really you know are basically trying always to think differently from from others and try new things and most of these things fail because that's the nature of the beast but they have had enough successes to begin for their R&D to be hugely successful now that's one thing so so it's a culture of pluralism tolerance and nonconformism that really matters, and that's part of that is a matter of policy. So in the Soviet Union, clearly under Stalin, you know there was there was none. But even after that, it didn't get all that much better. It's certainly true in 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 in, in China today, uh, whereas in the U.S., for all its faults, for all its things that that disagree with, but there basically is a notion uh, of tolerance, you know, of yeah. people having. People with crazy ideas. Well, you know, I mean, you, you want to try it? Try it. See what happens. You know that that kind of thing.